We were early in investing in startup tech companies that were delivering financial services to the mass market, right? Um, historically, banking penetration across the emerging markets was very low. Banks were seen as, as the privilege of you know, what often people will call the doctors and the engineers, so the upper classes. And that was true because of the economics of banking. Um, it was hard to build a beautiful glass-fronted bank branch and serve the mass market who were making you know, small transactions, frequent transactions that didn't make a lot of money for the bank. Um, I think going back over a decade, we started investing in the potential of reaching people with a simple feature phone uh, pre, you know, pre the ubiquity of the Android and iOS devices that are in people's pockets now, really in a 2G world. And I think um, some of those early investments we made helped move the market forward and move the market forward in a couple of important ways. I think, first of all, um, I'd like to think we helped prove the potential for fintech in general across the demographic spectrum to build sustainable, profitable businesses and impactful businesses that reach these mass market populations with products and services. Um, and as this wave of digital platforms that have become indispensable to our every, everyday lives, to start to think about themselves as financial service providers, I think some of the early investments we made um, have proven that. Let, let's, let's take an example, right? You can no longer be just an e-commerce company. You have, to be think, you have to think of yourself as an e-commerce company, but a company that allows your customer the option to buy now and pay later in installments. Increasingly, every checkout experience has that as an option. That takes you out of the realm of pure e-commerce and into the realm of financial services. You're now a credit provider. Now, you might not, as the e-commerce company, be the direct provider of credit. You may be partnering with somebody, uh, and we've got investments in that space, uh, Zest in India, for example, that partners with e-commerce companies and travel agents and the like to allow you to, to purchase now and pay later. But that's embedding finance into a very different transaction. And that's just the tip. Um, what, what these companies are doing is they're leveraging their core asset, a digital channel to the customer and that trusted relationship and a strong um, customer base to start to bring financial services more broadly to the populations. When we, when we are more specific about the gig platforms to your question, John, um, what the gig platforms have done is they've become a marketplace with two equally strong sites, right? They've got a strong and loyal customer base that's digitally connected to them and that's transacting frequently with them. And then they've got the loyal worker base and they're starting to figure out how to deliver financial services to both sides of the platform. As I said earlier, if you are in the flow of cash to your workers and you have that trust, you can start to think really creatively about how to embed financial services into the platform. And on the, on the customer side, if I'm a frequent user, the, the platform now has a lot of rich data on my usage patterns. Can they use that as an edge to start to bring me better services? Of course, we've got to keep in mind that there are restrictions around data privacy and data usage. Um, and I think across the globe, we're seeing both private sector and the government start to think more about that. And customer voices are important to be heard in this debate as well. But uh, once we solve some of those challenges, uh, I think we will continue to see both investments from Flourish, but also from others in the ecosystem that are now uh, highly sensitized to the potential of mass market financial services, of digital financial services, and of leveraging these platforms to, to embed vital uh, products that, that customers need and use. And as you and I yeah, talked I at one point, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Em. Sorry, I'm 
You, you had a no, point. I just wanted to jump in a bit as it relates to the U.S. I mean, what we're seeing is there's obviously these behemoth platforms that are serving the gig worker in different capacities. But as I mentioned earlier, about 43 million have identified their full-time job as being a portfolio of this type of work. And so what we're finding is a real need for a platform to aggregate those opportunities to optimize for the highest income level at any particular geography, to be able to stitch that work together that suits their needs. And then ideally supplement with some really rich financial services on the back end, most of which aren't currently being provided to the gig worker today. So, you know, insurance and retirement and healthcare and the like. And those are things that are really important as you think about how do you embed and how do you aggregate that base and then how do you provide rich services? As Steady being one of our companies in the U.S. has been kind of well positioned for that. But, but we think about that as a broader need, particularly as we look at the U.S. trends. And I, and I think that's a about that. point that I can just jump in, John. Go. I no, think please. as we, as, as M talked about this portfolio of work and this patchwork of jobs, right? It gives us an opportunity to think about not just financial services, which is in some ways optimizing the money you're already making, but how do we help people make more money? How do we help people be more creative about generating more income? Because that at the end of the day will drop right down to the bottom line. And that's when we really start to see uh, less of this financial vulnerability, less of the uncertainty around cash flows and more predictable, stable income. And that ultimately should be our goal. 